Good morning. Recalling last week's sermon about ethical and mindful eating, I apologize in advance to all the vegans and to those who are allergic to shellfish. <laughs> That's considered a minor tragedy in my hometown of Baltimore, Maryland, known for its seafood. You may be familiar with Baltimore and its presence in popular media, the TV shows The Wire or Homicide. I've seen neither. The Baltimore of my youth and first 30 years were more like John Waters' polyester or hairspray or a bit like any of the Barry Levinson films. Let's get some crabs was the rallying cry for pitching in to create a memorable Maryland summer ritual. In the 1960s and 70s, getting crabs to eat was accessible to everybody. Sometimes it would be a fundraiser for the VFW or the volunteer fire department. But most often, it was at somebody's backyard picnic table. Usually, whoever's trash got picked up on Monday. It was truly a communal event. Someone would have the inside track on where to get the biggest, heaviest crabs. It might be Captain Dick's, or Bay Island, or Timbuktu. Or it might be Uncle Al's friend of a friend who would get up early, drive to their secret spot on the bay, set up a line of crab pots from their runabout boat, and be back by noon with bushels of crabs to sell to friends and family. Even I have dropped a line with a chicken back off my grandfather's pier on Back River and was amazed to catch one. Really, anybody could do it. The vast Chesapeake Bay is a defining feature of Maryland. With 4,000 miles of shoreline, it's one of the world's largest estuaries where fresh and ocean water meet. Averaging only 22 feet deep, it's the perfect environment for fish, oysters, and of course, blue crabs. And it's a source of pride for the watermen, mostly men, and professional crab pickers, mostly women, whose hard work built an iconic, profitable seafood industry. But all of this I learned much later. I remember clinging to my mother's knee, my head not much higher than the tabletop, begging to be allowed to eat crabs. Then I had to be satisfied with a succulent claw, or if very lucky, a luscious clump of back fin. It was a rite of passage to be allowed at the table to be schooled in the art of picking a crab so nothing went to waste. I learned how to crack a claw, to extract the back fin in one deft move, and to avoid eating the lungs called the devil. When I was older, I got to help with setting up, laying out the newspaper, finding the wooden mallets, strategically placing the rolls of paper towels, and burying the National Bow or Pabst Blue Ribbon beer and Cokes in the cooler so that no one traipsed through the kitchen making a mess. The brave purists would do it all and steam the crabs. Since our topic this month is communion, I considered the idea of transubstantiation, or in this case, it's more like transmogrification of the blue crab through the process of steaming into an orange delicacy encrusted with Old Bay seasoning. Then someone would dump out the bushel basket of crabs on the table, and the feast would begin. The slow, hours-long process of painstakingly separating the meat from the shell was the perfect time to chat to the backdrop of the Orioles baseball game on the transistor radio. There'd be crab talk, of course. Prices, sizes, quality, how crabs were running, and who paid what per dozen where. And there's also trash talk about how folks in New Jersey or Louisiana would ruin a good crab by boiling it. Recipes for crab cakes and crab soup were swapped for the leftovers. It was also a time to share family stories and news, replay friendly arguments, get to know your cousins, and discuss the latest political scandals. Being Baltimore, there was always one brewing. As the home of Spiro Agnew, it's where I learned to vote at the very last minute, in case my candidate got indicted. <laughs> when you are living through times like these, it's pretty typical to take them for granted. Over the decades, pollution and 
poor stewardship of the bay has threatened the beloved tra tradition of the crab feast. Crabs are scarce. Prices skyrocketed. A dozen crabs that cost $8 in the 70s now cost 10 times that much, if you can get them at all, making this ritual out of reach now to blue-collar families like mine was. When I was newly single, I would walk home from work along Green Mount Avenue and buy a half a dozen from the guy in the storefront with a handwritten sign saying, crabs. I'd eat them alone on my front porch. It was a meal, but it wasn't a feast. Homesick in Minnesota, I air freighted crabs in, but it wasn't the same. Whenever I go home to Baltimore, my brother says, let's get some crabs. And for a few hours on a hot, humid summer afternoon, we remember. Thank you. Good morning, folks. I'll move the stand out of the way. Um, I'm Keith Wartman. Uh, my wife, Corrine, and I have been attending since uh, last September, coming up on a year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Coming up on a year, we've attended a lot of congregations over the years, uh, the most recent being First Parish in Concord in Concord, Massachusetts. We're happy to be here, so thank you all for welcoming, uh, welcoming us. We, uh, we've enjoyed it here in the past year or so. Uh, when thinking about memorable meals, many, many came to mind. Uh, lots of Thanksgiving meals in Montpelier, Vermont, where I grew up, and in Randolph, Vermont, at uh, Corrine's sister's house. Uh, summer barbecues with, with family, birthday celebrations, wedding receptions. The one that I chose, though, was uh, church suppers in New England, good old-fashioned church suppers. Uh, it's always supper. Rather than dinner, it's always church supper by, by tradition. Uh, they're usually fundraisers for uh, organizations in the church. And they were open to the public, so publicized around town, usually a, a big sign in front of the church, sometimes handwritten, uh, that publicized it, and then posters around town. The uh, shopkeepers and uh, folks around town were pretty good about hosting a, a poster in their in their shop about the big, the big church supper on Saturday. Um, so if, if you're wondering the, the distinction between a church supper and, and potlucks, the church supper is open to the public, the whole community. Everyone was invited in the whole town versus, say, a potluck dinner, which is internal for the church, church members only. They're usually held in the fall, or often held in the fall, in the autumn, uh, around foliage season in New England and hosted by, uh, hosted by a church in the fellowship hall, which was usually a big hall in the basement of the church. Yes, churches in New England have basements. Um, and there'd be tables, long tables lined up with white paper on them, all set to go with place settings. The, uh, the food prep and the cooking was a, a communal event, truly a communal event. Uh, many people from the church uh, would would help out, and it's interesting, this is even back in the 70s and 80s, uh, lots and lots of diverse people, men, women, young people, old people, would all participate in the, uh, in the preparation. It was, it was truly a communal event to put these things together. Um, some meals or some items were prepared at home by church members and then brought in for the church supper and donated donated to the church. So, you've heard this before, but my apologies to the vegetarians out there. <laughs> these, these, were, these were good old fashioned, you know, New England comfort food was, was the menu. So, my apologies in advance. However, there were usually lots of vegetables and breads and uh, lots of tasty pies. So, everyone could find something to eat. Um, the main course was usually something like turkey, roast turkey, that was really popular, or uh, roast chicken, chicken pot pie, baked ham, spaghetti, meatloaf, lasagna, you, you, get, you get the, the gist of it. Um, sometimes these things would actually be advertised by, by the main entree 
big turkey meal Saturday with all the fixins or all you can eat uh, spaghetti feast. Side dishes, lots of them, usually vegetables, uh, many from the gardens of, of the church members, uh, the, folks, the folks who were who were putting on this thing. Corn, green beans, peas, squash, always mashed potatoes with gravy. <laughs> Rich gravy, always. Uh, baked beans, stuffing, pasta salads, rolls uh, with real butter, and occasionally biscuits or cornbread, but rolls and butter were the, were the main thing. Uh, casseroles, lots and lots of casseroles. Uh, chicken and rice, shepherd's pie, tuna noodle, turkey casserole, green beans with fried onions. One of the classics, right? The onions go on the top. Macaroni and cheese, scalloped potatoes, you, you get the gist of it. Lots and lots of uh, casseroles. Uh, beverages were pretty simple. Usually water and milk were about it. Uh, there were some exceptions, but generally that was, that was it. And coffee. Dark, rich coffee. High test. So this, and this was church coffee, and it always seemed to me that church coffee was the best coffee ever. I'm wondering if, you know, is there a secret church blend, you know, only available to churches, right? The stuff is awesome. It's just awesome. Uh, dessert was usually pies, fruit pies, uh, apple, blueberry, cherry, pumpkin, strawberry, rhubarb, that, that's a thing in New England, strawberry and rhubarb. The, the strawberries offset the tartness of the, uh, of the rhubarb, and it's awesome. So I, if you haven't had it, I'd recommend that you seek it out. It's really good. It, it's better than it sounds, let me say that. <laughs> uh, sometimes cheesecake, but usually pies. Fruit pies were the thing, right? So communion part, the communion part, let's get to that. So communion means fellowship, mutual participation, participation and sharing. And church suppers were definitely all three, absolutely all three of those. Fellowship with all the diners, mutual participation, folks who put these things together were church members, and, and sharing, lots and lots of sharing. Uh, diners would come in from all walks of life. Again, they're open to the community, so all kinds of people were there. Seating was open, folks would simply find a comfortable place for them and their family. And folks were really good about introducing themselves to others around them. And uh, so it was a large group of people from different backgrounds. And, and you'd often make a new acquaintance that night from, from the community, which, is, uh, which was nice. There'd be a short grace given by the minister uh, of, of the church. And it was usually very short and simple. Again, these were folks from the community at large, from many, many different faith traditions or none at all. So it was usually a simple, simple statement of, of thankfulness. And then, and then on to it, right? <laughs> on to the meal. Uh, usually the teenagers from the church, from the host church would serve. Uh, these be served family style. So tables, big platters of, uh, of the food were brought out to the tables. The diners would serve themselves and then pass and it may sound a little chaotic, but it all worked out. Somehow it all worked out. So the uh, conversation would flow pretty well, actually. Uh, the weather, uh, the local news, and that's code for gossip. <laughs> Lots of gossip. Uh, the Red Sox, the New England Patriots, and family. Uh, we, always, we always would talk about family, how the kids are doing, how grandma's doing. Uh, the atmosphere was pretty positive and, and pretty open. It, it, was, it, it was really nice. So when the, when the meal was over, uh, the diners would, would file out and chatting with one another again. It was kind of a, a festive, positive uh, mood in these things. And then the church volunteers would get to it, cleaning up and uh, washing the dishes. And even back in the day, we had industrial dishwashers, so, uh, so we did take care of that. And then storing all of, all of the leftover food, or some of it would be donated to local, local causes. Again, a team effort, as I recall, even back in the 70s and 80s, a team effort. Men, women, children, teenagers, all kinds of people would contribute to this. So now, 
This was in the fall or winter in New England, and so it would sometimes snow, of course, while, while, uh, while the supper was going on. So we'd all be greeted with a few inches of snow on, on the cars to brush off. However, however, the, uh, the task of brushing off went very well because of the four or five cups of church coffee that you'd had with, with dessert. So, so the brushing was a, was a very active, very active, fast, <clears throat> not manic exactly, but close, close to it, activity. So the church suppers in New England, uh, communal events, absolutely. I, I think, uh, you know, description of uh, communion is really apt, apt for those. Uh, organization, the preparation, you know, the advertising, and the cleanup at the end was, was truly a, a, a communal event. So folks really seemed to, to enjoy those, and the, the spirit was always, was always positive and, and congenial at these. Thank you. Hello, I'm Linda Jurgen. About 20 years ago, I was traveling in Italy with a friend who, having converted to Catholicism late in life, was interested in visiting places of religious significance. So we made a reservation to view La Da Vinci's Last Supper, or Il Cenacolo, the little dinner as it is known by Italians. When we entered the refectory of Santa Maria della Grazie in Milan, I was immediately struck by the size of the artwork. It fills an entire wall and measures about 23 by 29 feet. It's a monumental painting and has monumental meaning for the Catholic Church. Earlier this month, Reverend Kent began our discussion of communion by telling us that the Catholic sacrament has its origins in the story behind the Last Supper, the meal Jesus had with his disciples just before his crucifixion. At this point in the story, Jesus knew that he would shortly be betrayed by one disciple and denied by another. Still, he had this to say, a new commandment I give you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. I think Unitarian Universalists, skeptics, agnostics, atheists, humanists, rationalists, and Christians alike can embrace and seek to practice this directive. And for my family, through three generations, food has been our love language. I am a self-proclaimed foodie, more like Guy Fieri with his mac and cheese and barbecue than Anthony Bourdain with his weird and yucky foods from around the world. <laughs> I come to this predilection quite naturally. I was born into a foodie family. It all started with my grandma, Glennie, who made her way from Arkansas through New Mexico, arriving in California with no husband and armed with only a third grade education. She supported her three kids cooking chili at a high school, at a high school lunch stand in San Pedro. Then when her oldest daughter married, moved north to Walla Walla, Washington, and started a restaurant featuring fried chicken and homemade rolls, Grandma moved too. This was the Trolley Inn, built out of a repurposed trolley and featuring a giant chicken on the roof. <laughs> this is a photograph of a painting done of what had become a local icon. Soon the whole family got involved. My Uncle John was the cook. My Aunt Kate and mother, nicknamed Dutch, were waitresses. And my Grandma Glennie made the pies. 
That was the site of my most vivid memories. My brother and I were there a lot. Uncle John indulged our every whim. We made all kinds of crazy concoctions, both sweet and savory, sometimes scrumptious and sometimes not. Out of the extra dough my uncle needed every morning to make the rolls. The rolls we then ate, slathered with the butter my Uncle John kept in a crock on the grill. And my uncle gave us all the fried chicken we could eat. What with ice cream on tap any time we wanted, it was a kid's paradise. When my father had a heart attack at age 36 and couldn't find a job in Walla Walla, we moved for a very hot two and a half years to Texas before we got a reprieve and my dad's job brought us to California. Nevertheless, during this time, we spent all of our family vacations in Walla Walla, which we considered to be God's country. So my childhood was filled with wonderful, if plain, food. Because my mother always worked, we had our fanciest meals on Sundays, alternating fried chicken and pot roast. Eventually, the trolley inn was driven out of business by year-long reconfiguration of roads in Walla Walla. But my Uncle John wasn't finished with the food business. He was hired to manage the food service at the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. And our conversations then revolved around topics like his taking a cadre of trustees to fish for salmon on the Columbia River and how far a single onion could go to flavor the tartar sauce they made to go with it. And as for my grandma, Glennie, she finished her food career as a fry cook at the wrong end of Main Street, where everyone in town called her mom. So there you have it, my family history with food. So nowadays, I still cook for others, my family at birthdays and holidays, and I offer auction items for church members, too. Recently, my brother had a birthday. He was 79 on August 3rd. Although I spend a lot of time, you can ask my friends, venting and even ranting about his politics, I still love him. So naturally, I invited him and my sister-in-law over for a birthday dinner. He requested fried chicken, his favorite since childhood. Then I got the bright idea to invite his children to join us. This was very tricky because he and his children have developed a rather rancorous relationship born out of clashing political positions and lifestyle choices. My brother and his wife are conservative, economically um, successful, and money focused. My niece, named after me, is a hippie. <laughs> Progressive, pottery making, underpaid, alternative junior high school art and science teacher. And my nephew is newly divorced and struggling to start a new career in home finance. It was questionable that the younger generation would even come. They had to think about it but they did come. I had decided to surprise my brother with their presence and didn't tell him they would be there. <laughs> I was hoping something good would happen, that there would be detente, that they could enjoy each other without bringing up politics or any of the other hot buttons that trigger them into saying hurtful things. After all, my brother is getting older and I hate it that his relationship with his children is so fraught with anger. I thought my presence and my house and my rules would temper their behavior. I thought fried chicken would save the day. <laughs> <laughs> it could have all blown up in my face, but it didn't for the most part. My sister-in-law, unwilling to sit in the living room with my brother and his children, came to join me in the kitchen as I was frying the chicken. She said, I probably won't be staying just to let you know. 
I simply replied, that's too bad. At which point my brother came and had a very quiet conversation with her in front of the refrigerator, just a few feet away. I couldn't hear a word dug on it. <laughs> but she stayed. She scowled and didn't speak, but she stayed. My niece and nephew were delightful, and I got to catch up on news of their children, and so did my brother. Chloe is a senior design student at Otis, is selling her designs already, and is working several part-time jobs besides. Nico has graduated from high school and is taking online classes at junior college in a wide array of subject, subjects and is playing his guitar and other instruments. My great nephews are spending their time playing club soccer and going on hikes searching for Pokemon with their dad. The important thing here is that all of us got together facilitated by the promise of fried chicken and memories of good times of our youth. We talked and laughed. We caught a glimpse of what life as friends could be if only we let go of our various wounds from the past. It was a communion of the dinner table and a practice session of how things might be if we could only love one another.